Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Herbert Hoover, and the focus is the stock market crash. The year is 1929. The 1920s had been a roaring decade for the United States economy. Greatest prosperity in the history of the country. Wages were up. Unemployment was down. The federal government had surpluses just about every year. They had been able to pay down the debt. There was some weakness in the global economy here late in the 1920s. And some people were getting a little bit nervous. Maybe there was a, a bubble going on. Particularly in the United States, there was some nervousness, at least with some, about the stock market. The market had absolutely soared in the last couple of years. In fact, it had doubled in 1927. The market was about 150 for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. To year 1929, two years later, it was over 300. A lot of this was based on speculation, which would some at this point were calling flat out gambling. Brokers were borrowing as much money as they could at any interest rate they could get from the banks, pouring into the market because they just kept making more and more money. It was kind of a can't miss deal. Not to Herbert Hoover, though. For the last three years, he had been warning people about this. Hoover said that the fever of speculation resting on over optimism that can only land us on the shores of over depression. A kind of a sad irony that the coming Great Depression would be called the Hoover Depression, an irony according to Adolf Miller of the Federal Reserve Board, who said that the board knew that Mr. Hoover, from 1926 on, had been protesting that the money policy of the reserve system was certain to bring about disaster and calamity. Mr. Hoover, before and after he took office, was struggling desperately to curb credit extravagance. The record will show that he became the victim of a policy that was anathema to him the whole time it was in operations. Well, the market reached an apex on September the 3rd of 1929 at 386 points. Over the next six weeks, there was wild fluctuations until the day of October the 23rd, day of high volume trading, went way down, closing at 305. The very next day, radio stocks, next to give back about 40% of their value. Steel stocks started to crash as well. That day it closed oh, below 300 for the first time in months on 13 million shares of trading. Well, a weekend showed up. People were hoping for a better activity on the following Monday. They did not get it. Another 13% dip. The Dow is now down to 260. And then Black Tuesday, 16 million shares traded. It fell 11%, closing at 230, losing $14 billion in market value just in that one day. By mid-November of 1929, the market in a short period of time of just less than a month had lost about a third of its market value, $26 billion. And in inflation-adjusted numbers in 2023, that would be nearly half a trillion dollars. Now, the first reaction from uh, many folks, businessmen, economists, uh, politicians, academics, the press, don't worry about this. Not a big deal. The New York Times said confidence in the soundness of the stock market structure, notwithstanding the upheaval of the last few days, was voiced last night by bankers and other financial leaders. One of those financial leaders was a professor from Yale by the name of Irvin Fisher, and he said yesterday's break was a shaking out of the lunatic fringe that attempts to speculate on margin. After all, only about 2.5% of the American people were invested in stocks, so maybe they could contain the damage just to the stock market it, and then the economy might be able to bounce back based on some of these sound fundamentals that people are talking about. But the economic setbacks in the United States were called panics for a reason, and Herbert Hoover, the president, knew it. According to Hoover, apprehension and fear are what we have to combat. Among business, that it will lose markets, and among the poor, that they will lose their jobs. 90% of our difficulty in depressions is caused by fear. What I want to do is mitigate the effect of the recent crash, get back on the road to recovery as quickly as possible. We must cushion this crash, and we must restore confidence. And there should be confidence, for our country is fundamentally sound. Hoover went into action based on his principles. There would be no handouts. Historically, the American federal government had never given handouts, put people on the dole during tough economic times. They basically would ride it out and the economy would fix itself. But it did, still didn't mean it would stand aside and do nothing. Hoover believed that he could get industry to voluntarily take some actions that would be beneficial. And so we started holding conferences in the White House, different industries, different leaders every single day. The message, though, was the same. Keep wages up. 
don't have massive layoffs. He would tell labor, don't strike. Let's agree to work on this together cooperatively, and that's how we'll get through it. He said this is not dictation or interference by the government with business. It is a request from the government that you cooperate in prudent measures to solve a national problem. A great responsibility and a great opportunity rest upon the business and economic organization of the country. The task is one fitted to its fine initiative and courage. Now, Hoover believed that he was actually grateful that many would comply, and he believed that by the spring of 1930, things had gotten to be relatively stable and perhaps looking, looking better. On May the 2nd of 1930, Hoover said that we have been passing through one of those great economic storms which periodically bring hardship and suffering to our people. While the crisis took place only six months ago, I am convinced we have passed the worst, and with continued unity of effort, we shall recover we shall rapidly recover. Now, Hoover was later criticized heavily for being excessively optimistic at this stage of the Depression. Hoover thought the statement was perfectly natural. The, uh, the presidents cannot be pessimistic in times of national difficulties, he said. They must be encouraging. However, this bit of optimism was later distorted by our opponents to make me say, prosperity is just around the corner, which I never did say. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Hoover's primary concern, jobs. Unemployment, it had been under 5% for most of the decade of the 1920s. Here in 1930, it had already hit 8.7%. Now, this was still well under the 12% that unemployment sat just about 10 years before in the previous recession. But still, 8.7%, that number going up, it's the major focus of Herbert Hoover, who said the presidency is primarily an employment agency to find jobs for millions of people. Again, no handouts, but he would continue to push industry to behave along the lines he was advocating, and he would push public works projects. The federal government, state and local governments, encouraging them to accelerate construction projects. Things like roads and bridges and ports and buildings, things with long-term value, that could put people to work in the short term, all part of the campaign from Hoover, but again, no handouts. A new wrinkle in all of this was political in this era. Now, John Raskob was the chair of the Democratic Party, the opposition party to Hoover, and frankly, he was tired of losing landslide elections to the Republicans like it happened for the last three times. And he said, look, I'm not going to wait to the election year to put a campaign in place. I'm going to start right away. And early in Hoover's term, he made a move to hire Charlie Mickelson. Mickelson was a popular reporter for the New York World. He was known as the ghost because every day he would write dozens of speeches and articles and talking points, hand them out to congressmen, senators, other leaders, basically to pillory Herbert Hoover nonstop over again. These were the ones who put the terms Hoover depression into the American vocabulary. He made people living in destitute areas calling them Hoovervilles. Overly optimistic, as we talked about. Well, Hoover's going to be slammed for that. He was also a president who apparently did nothing to help the American people over and over again. This was the messaging coming from the pen of Charlie Mickelson and the Democrats starting from the very early in Hoover's term. This was all natural for Mickelson, who said that a man sat in the president's chair who did not fit. His undoubted genius in certain directions did not run along the lines of a chief executive of a great nation. A successful president must be a great politician, using the term in its most complimentary sense. The ability to function along with parallel and equal partners in government is much a requisite for adequate administration as any other branch of the science of statesmanship. And as far as Mickelson was concerned, Hoover didn't have any of this. His writing, his efforts absolutely worked. These thoughts about the Hoover Depression, Hooverville's, entered the American consciousness. Look, times were really tough. People wanted someone to blame. Mickelson gave him that person, and this absolutely had an impact. Well, sometimes they stretch the truth a little bit, poking fun at Hoover, maybe in some not very kind ways, and his, his colleagues were advising the president to, to repudiate these, these comments, to, to actually make a stand in the political arena. Hoover said no. I cannot take time for my job to answer such stuff. No man can catch up with a lie. If the American people wish to believe such things about me, it cannot be helped. Only one side was talking, and a lot of people believed exactly what was coming out of the pen of Charlie Mickelson. Plus, the economy was still tanking. The Republicans lost badly in the 1930 midterms. Congress now split between Republicans and Democrats, but since a number of progressive-leaning Republicans would often vote with the Democrats, it's going to be really tough for Herbert Hoover to get any of his agenda 
agenda through in the last two years of his term. And again, his, his, his efforts really weren't working. Unemployment was rising, banks were failing. Andrew Mellon, the Secretary of the Treasury, gave him some really tough advice. He said the opportunity here is basically liquidate it all. Liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmers, liquidate real estate. The faster you hit rock bottom, the faster you'll get on the road to recovery. Now, Hoover thought that this was, was cruel. Still didn't want to give handouts, but he thought just having everything liquidate wasn't the answer either. But he was leery about other people in Congress who just wanted to give money and lots of it to the American people as that being the answer. And Fulker Hoover, this was essentially un-American. He said that prosperity cannot be restored by raids upon the public treasury. The leaders of both parties are cooperating to prevent any such event. Some of these schemes are ill-considered. Some represent enthusiasts and some represent the desire of individuals to show they're more generous than the administration or that they're more generous than the leaders of their own parties. They are playing politics at the expense of human misery. But nothing was really working halfway through the Hoover presidency. A lot of misery for the American people, a lot of misery for Herbert Hoover, and things were about to get worse. But that is the story for another day. That is Herbert Hoover and the stock market crash in the life of Herbert Hoover. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.